Uh, I would now call upon uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. Is he here? Yes. <coughs> so, he would be speaking uh, to us on perspectives of school education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bora, Mr. Srivastava, uh, fellow panelists, uh, friends. It gives me great pleasure to join this discussion on the new uh, national policy of education. No policy document is uh, easy to read, um, and this one is no different. Uh, one looks for its vision, one looks for the assumptions on which it is based. One also looks at the information it uses and the information it um, ignores. And more than anything else, uh, one tries to find which systemic experience uh, does it privilege and which experience it decides to ignore. That's also uh, where many choices are made in all policy documents. If we look back over the last more than 100 years of attempts to create a policy, for as diverse a country as ours, with uh, a very complex society and uh, numerous forms of inequalities, modern education has certainly faced an enormous challenge in our country. And surely this is the right moment in the middle of a pandemic for us to worry about our children as um, a new policy attempts to guide their future. When I look back over the last three decades, uh, a little more than that, since the promulgation of the last national policy, of 1986, I find the most uh, path-breaking event uh, to be the promulgation of the Right to Education Act by the Indian Parliament. This act came in as an enabling law permitting the amendment to the Constitution which was made earlier, which would allow every child in India, no matter what his or her background, to have the advantage of eight continuous years of free and compulsory education. In many ways, this was a momentous law to be passed by the Indian parliament. And in fact, it was the first parliamentary um, law in the field of school education. It took nearly a century to come to this point. Therefore, for our nation, it was a major moment. For us who work in the field of education, it was also a great moment to witness a document which finally created a credible and firm foundation for a school system in India. It defined a school system with the help of stringent norms that it laid down. It defined the school system in terms of the kinds of purposes which elementary education must serve. And it also created a sense of a parameter beyond which the system will not be allowed to deviate, so to say. In many ways, it was a path-breaking document, therefore. It posed an end, so to say, to volunteerism, to the discourse of non-formal education, which the 1986 policy had, in fact, under those circumstances, permitted uh, to become part of uh, the system. The RTE law ultimately promised to India a system where all aspects from teacher to curriculum to infrastructure and uh, conditions in which children are taught, all these aspects will become justiciable. 
the fact that uh, the RT law made um, a clear cut outline of what is it that constitutes the right of children from 6 to 14 years of age to education the fact that it delineated the parameters of a system so clearly uh, was indeed a heartening moment for uh, lakhs of people like me uh, who work in this sector the late professor tapas mazumdar had provided an initial estimate of the financial support that the translation of the right to education into a social reality will require it was a considerable budget that professor majumdar presented and justified and it was going to be a part of the implementation process in which both the center and the states would have a clearly indicated share as far as financial responsibilities were concerned now merely a decade has passed since the social history of rte actually started to unfold and this decade has not been a particularly easy decade because the rte has faced legal systemic and social obstacles as one might have expected and already some amendments have been made to it but now we are facing a situation where this historic law is likely to be undermined we are back to the era where community volunteers will present themselves in teaching positions where a certain kind of looseness will be permitted in the name of local varieties of control and where the stringent norms that the RTE provided for are not likely to be backed up by sufficient funding there is no follow up of the tapas mazumdar effort in any case over the last 10 years but the manner in which the new document treats the right to education act i think the Uh, one of the many things that it's looking at is indeed something that makes one wonder why india cannot stick to the achievement it has made in the past why can't it sustain an effort started earlier give it the credit that it deserves and then maintain that effort for the next several decades we have seen numerous such breaks in the past new decisions are made for a few years these decisions excite people and then they are forgotten and it seems that in the context of right to education act we are witnessing the start of precisely that kind of um, trajectory i say that particularly because we now are looking at in this new new document an altogether new structure for the education of young children the old structure which started off with kothari in 1966 offered 10 years of comprehensive school education with 2 years of higher secondary education it was called popularly as 10 plus 2 system we are now faced with the proposal of a new system which is called 5 plus 3 for the elementary part now how have the 8 years of rte now been restructured you might ask and at this point particularly it's somewhat uncomfortable to realize that already the rte structure is going to be nudged so soon after its promulgation so many states had managed to create an 8 year structure with 5 years of primary and 3 years of upper primary education well the new structure takes us downwards to 3 years children children's age at 3 when they will be inducted into this early childhood program which will last for 5 years including 3 years of preschool and the first two grades of primary now that makes it 5 
And then after facing an exam, they will have the remaining three years of the present primary school system, after which they will have three more years of upper primary. That's how this five plus three plus three new system works. And this early childhood education, which is, of course, a, a, a great um, foundational area, needs to be looked at more carefully in our midst. Several years ago, the CBSC had appointed a committee called the Ganguly Committee, which was uh, faced with the question, how long should a feasible early childhood education should be for our country? And it came to the conclusion that two years of preschool education uh, is perhaps most suitable and feasible. Uh, and after that, grade one can start. That committee had taken into account the widespread tendency that our system has shown to start early childhood education with the alphabet, with literacy and numeracy. Now, so far it used to uh, be delayed as much as possible uh, in many parts of the country to age four and in many parts age five. And perhaps you are aware that in many uh, countries of the world, introduction of reading is delayed up to, grade, up to age six, though there are countries where it starts much earlier. We are now looking at that point where perhaps three-year-olds will be involved in what we are now being presented with, namely a foundational literacy and numeracy program that explicitly aims at making children school ready when they are about to join grade one of education. So in a way, the distinction between the years of early childhood and the primary school years that begin at uh, age six or after completion of age five, that distinction is about to be blurred. The instrumentality of this process for the millions of children in India uh, will be the Anganwadi, which for so many years has served India's children, uh, but has never been seen uh, as, a, as an educational institution. Its new incarnation will make it um, a part of this new system, and one can only wish it well at this moment. But at this moment, it's also important for us to look at a theoretical question. What are the perils of prematurely imparted literacy to a child? What are the perils of making the child school ready from such an early age? Now, it's already happening, so one doesn't need to speculate. It's already happening in uh, our metropolitan cities and many smaller towns as well, that right from the age of three, if not earlier, children are being prepared for grade one. So, de facto, grade one has come down to uh, age three. And at that age, when children uh, don't even have uh, 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 bones, properly formed bones in their hands, they are taught to write. Uh, before they have experience of language in diverse registers, they are presented with the alphabet. And what is known in the circle of social linguistics as reading without meaning is promoted. By the time a child comes to grade one, uh, many teachers will testify to this, that the bridge between meaning and words has already snapped. Decades of theoretical research on this matter around the world shows that once this bridge is broken, it's very difficult to rebuild it in the rest of life. Because this is the bridge through which children cross over from spoken language into a written language which can be read. Because when we read a book, our hope is to make sense of it, to imagine what is it that the author of this book is trying to tell us. And where is he or she coming from? These acts of analogical, imaginative thinking become impossible for those who are taught in mechanistic ways in early childhood. And 
therefore, this is a matter of great national importance as uh, we enter the era of introduction of literacy at an early age. Using surveys which are of a dubious nature that tell us that uh, our achievement in primary and upper primary grades in these areas of reading and arithmetic is poor. Um, these surveys are not particularly academically so reliable. And yet as a source of information, uh, uh, they do sometimes serve the purpose of alerting us. But one had never imagined that they will be used as a basis for um, a new draft of a national policy. They are. And so we are at a point uh, where it seems that uh, the great amount of awareness that since the days of Tagore, uh, we have accumulated about how children move along on the path to becoming fully aware and sensitive citizens that great tradition of knowledge to which so many have contributed, that tradition perhaps now is going to be a thing of the past. One also worries about at this juncture on how the grade one teacher is going to deal with the challenges of primary education. The children who are uh, coming with a kind of literacy and numeracy, which is not necessarily associated with the child's attempt to make sense of things, make sense of the world. This teacher that the RT Act had envisaged uh, with so much clarity in its chapter five will now face a new challenge. States that had already created um, a structure which would fit the RT we'll have to start all over again. And we hopefully will see uh, some genuine inquiry by different states to see how feasible this exercise of placing three earlier preschool years with first two years of primary education, how this idea works. The idea of introducing exams, which was prohibited in the RTE, has in any case come back to an amendment so powerful is the pressure of systemic tendencies, which even though disruptive on many other levels, this policy is unable to disrupt. Permit me to say that I'm not taking a bleak view, necessarily bleak view. Education is affected by a vast number of factors, including the ingenuity of the teacher and the force of circumstances under which society expects governments to work. And with great faith in our society and our nation, I do hope that the way in which the new document's vision will unfold, it will prove self-corrective. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, we, we have got a large number of questions, but I'm confining only to uh, five questions. Uh, and again, I'm uh, grouping these questions uh, speaker-wise. So uh, I'll uh, put uh, three questions together to first to start with uh, Professor Krishna Kumar, and then uh, two questions uh, together to Professor Bihar, and one question to Professor uh, Shyam Menon. Uh, 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 I would like to uh, first uh, start with by mentioning that uh, this webinar has evoked a uh, lot of response across the country. Uh, more than 800 persons have uh, logged in uh, to this webinar. Uh, sir, uh, 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 there are three questions uh, which are addressed to uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. The first one is, what is the purpose of uh, what is the purpose of national exams in class three, class five, and class eight? Would it not put pressure on students at young age? Uh, the second question to Krish Professor Krishna Kumar is that NEP 20 has merged various groups under one category of SEDGs, SEDGs, which constitute majority population of students. What will be its implication uh, of merging the categories at a school level? And the third question is, sir, does not Shah Rukh Khan saying school ke baad baiju raise a big question mark 
on our current indian education system does this kind of advertisement show the real image of current education system in india will the new education policy change this perspective of our education system where everyone needs tuition classes after school professor krishna kumar please these questions are addressed to you thank you <clears throat> uh my answer to the first question is that yes a uh, reintroduction of an examination based evaluation system uh in the elementary uh classes uh at these two or three points will certainly increase stress on children as it is we are proposing uh starting of uh, their education from such a tender age of 3 and given the realities of our early childhood provisions right now uh the stress on children which is already very high across the system can only increase with uh, introduction of exams something which the right to education act uh, had prohibited now um the result of this stressful situation is that a tuition system a parallel coaching system has uh, taken place across the system right from early childhood up to the highest stage of school education uh, we notice that across the country a coaching tuition system has uh, virtually become a parallel system uh, and in many cases it undermines the main school system it seems that uh, given the uh, realities of how this restructuring uh, will unfold uh, the coaching and the tuition system is not likely to diminish at all in fact it may flourish um there is no consideration at the moment as to how we will increase uh, quality in early childhood education at the moment we don't have even norms for it and they can't be created out of the sky um the entire issue of focusing on this parallel system has been in fact ignored and one can read the document thinking that uh, our system actually doesn't have such a parallel system uh, which has seriously undermined uh, the purposes of education uh, by making it so important for every child to take coaching on tuition at some stage or the other in fact our iits and our medical colleges they are all now uh, admitting students who have been heavily coached it's not a competition among uh, the most potential engineers and doctors among children rather it's a competition among how much uh, expenditure has been made by parents for coaching their children uh, for these entrance tests so in that sense the system has been undermined and is likely to uh, remain like that and this particular malaise can only increase as years come by uh, the second question i couldn't quite hear if you may kindly uh, repeat it once the the second question is that uh, nep20 has merged various groups under one category of sedg which can suit majority population of students what will be implication of this merging of categories at a school level yes uh when it comes to recognizing the specific uh, uh categories uh, that the government system has worked with so far it's unfortunate that this document doesn't uh, recognize those categories whether it's the scheduled castes or uh, the scheduled tribes or uh, uh, the minorities Uh, or uh, other forms of social disadvantage uh, including uh, the other backward classes and so on uh, the lumping together of all these very sociologically entrenched and well recognized categories into a broader generalized kind of title is certainly problematic and one doesn't know exactly what's the purpose of that lumping when in fact we know that it's a matter of pride for our country that our policies of positive discrimination uh, have worked despite all obstacles and across the world they are appreciated the extent to which uh, the goals of equity have been served by a policy of reservation 
and special treatment of different groups and recognition of these different groups, the extent to which these policies have been pursued over the years has been a matter of some appreciation. Or even though there are uh, numerous uh, uh, causes of dissatisfaction, but the general direction has been appreciated. Uh, what's the point of now lumping these categories and forgetting them as if they don't exist? As if India doesn't have a caste-divided society. As if we don't have problems of uh, disadvantage over generations. As if our tribal children um, uh, have the same starting point as anybody else. Uh, it's a kind of an act of pretension. And unfortunately, the document does have many such acts of pretension kind of wishing away a reality by not noticing it and uh, creating a sort of a fantasy of all problems getting resolved. This speaks of a very imaginative kind of instrumentality, uh, which is certainly problematic if you are looking for uh, good insights and practical solutions. Thank you. Uh, the... The next set of questions is to Professor Anurag Bihar. Uh, the new policy, how much it would be effective in the globalized world, it lays a lot of emphasis on education in uh, local language, whereas English is becoming an important mode of conversation in this world. The second question is, why the final document of NEP is so different from the draft submitted in 2019. And the third question, this third question has been asked by a very senior IS officer, Mr. Dev Shahayam. He says that this policy is predatory policy with the center violating the constitution and federal structure of India. How can the center arbitrarily grab school education from the states and dictate terms? school education must return to the state's list as it was before 1976. Professor Anurag Bihar. Thank you. Uh, so, how does this policy respond to the increased globalization, increased uh, integration of the globe and things like Yes. Well, and I think that question's focus was particularly on the matter of education and that to English. So uh, I think the policy just bases itself on uh, the well understood, the well recorded, the, uh, the with overbearing evidence that uh, children learn better in their own language. And therefore the policy recommends that uh, the medium of instruction should be should be their own language. Now, at the same time, it is equally emphatic that children learn multiple languages well and much better at a younger age. So the policy is while focusing on the matter that let's make the mother tongue, the local language, the home language as the medium of instruction, but at the same time, through multiple measures, is encouraging the idea of multilingualism. And within that multilingualism, it's of course Indian languages, but certainly there is English. So I don't think the policy in any way is disbalancing the fundamental education issue that the mother tongue is a better medium of instruction versus perhaps these aspirations and the economic needs of learning other languages, including English. Uh, the second question was to do with uh, why is the 66 page policy very different from the 484 page policy? Yes. Uh, now, you know, that's a question I will find it very hard to answer because I was involved in writing the 484 page policy I was not involved in cutting down the 44 pages into the 66 pages. But I can speculate. Uh, one part of the speculation is that uh, it, uh, it just in the sheer mechanics 
of summarizing 484 pages into 66 pages, a lot of it is lost. And what you lose, some of it might just be happenstance, some of it might be purposive, I don't know. So I think some of the differences are because of that. Some of the differences are because uh, perhaps uh, at the policy level, uh, when the final policy was decided upon, uh, the government of India did want to take a few different stances from what is there in the draft national education policy. But I must, uh, I must say that, uh, uh, yes, there are differences. Uh, yes, there are some noticeable differences. But uh, it's not as dramatic as the questions seem to suggest. But let me remind you, I'm just speculating here because I was not involved in cutting down the 484 pages to 66 pages. Uh, the third is that, is the central, the union government predatory? And uh, is it taking over the state's uh, rights and responsibilities of school education? Well, perhaps that, um, perhaps that trend goes back a long way, if that's happening. Uh, however, I must say that if you, if one reads the policy carefully, on the school education side, it is making suggestions. If you read the text, that's what it's doing. It is making suggestions. It is in no way suggesting that the government of India is actually deciding that that's exactly the way it will be. Now, uh, when the Kothari Commission recommendations were implemented, the situation was pretty much the same. How are you going to have a nationally coherent uh, set of principles, if not exactly the same system, at the same time, leaving to the state, or why just the state, to the school, what is due to the state and the school? So we've been through this before. I don't read this policy as being particularly predatory uh, on the rights of the states. Thank you. The next question is uh, to uh, Professor uh, Menon. This the question asker is very important person, Dr. Ramesh and Deka, who was uh, director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. His question is how to internationalize higher education in India. Uh, well. Uh, this is not about the policy, surely. Uh, I think if yes. it's about the policy, one should ask the people who wrote the policy. No, it's not for relating it's to policy. It is about, a general question. Um, you know, the global excellence and uh, globally uh, accepted standards and so on uh, is often, um, you know, is often understood. And it's not just about this policy, but for several years, maybe for some 10, 15 years in India, this discourse of, um, you know, uh, uh, what is what is of international standards and global standards, uh, world standards? All these used to be said, and I, I really feel that a, a globally excellent institution has to be first of all locally relevant. So uh, only when it has an organic uh, rooting on firm firm rooting on a particular stratum, and is responding to that stratum uh, uh, in an organic manner, uh, uh, then. Can it rise itself to the level of a global, globally excellent institution? So international standards is largely in that sense. I wouldn't be really, uh, you know, think in terms of just collaborations and, uh, uh, you know, and faculty exchanges and uh, twinning programs and stuff like that alone. That doesn't really create much of an international standards. Neither will uh, inviting um, uh, world players uh, in uh, foreign universities to come and set up shops here. We are also not is not going to help. I think we need to really work in terms of creating excellent faculty. And if institutions have to be developed, there has to be good faculty. And we have to think of a serious program of uh, creating excellence in our prospective faculty, attracting young, bright people to come into academia. Um, and, uh, a lot of attitudinal, the, the whole environmental the ethos has to change for that. At the moment, it's a very unhappy situation. I hope it, it doesn't last for long. But at least in public universities, it's, a, it's an environment of, um, uh, you know, uh, being feeling oppressed and fearful. And I don't think those are the places where good research will happen. 
and uh, those are the places will innovation of ideas will happen uh, all this will happen only if there is a certain liberality in the way in which universities the ecosystem of universities located and only then will we rise to the international standards it, it's not just a ligotoy approach of uh, you know uh, creating um, standard templates in various parts of the country and uh, uh, with linkages with uh, institutions abroad and suddenly it becomes international i don't think it happens like that Salash, you can proceed to. Are you going to deliver your vote oh, yes, tonight? Sir, uh, <laughs> sir, now we come to the end of the program, uh, and I would, on behalf of India Institute Center, uh, I would like to profusely thank uh, Professor Narayan Bihar, Dr. Krishna Kumar, Professor uh, Shamanan for sparing their time for this webinar. and as i had mentioned earlier this webinar has really aroused lot of interest and uh, uh, the number of participants who have joined this webinar indicates that and i'm sure today's deliberations are definitely going to be much more helpful in understanding uh, this new policy so with these uh, words i once again thank each one of you profusely on behalf of iisc and i look forward for your more and more participation in, in iisc webinars and uh, physical programs in future and in the end i also like to thank our uh, president uh, sri anil vora who was kind enough to spare his time for uh, chairing this uh, entire uh, session uh, thank you very much sir and i thank everybody who has uh, joined uh, this webinar uh, through the virtual mode thank you very much thanks everybody thank you thank, thank you so much thank you thank you very much thank you everyone thank you.